Tonight, bus blaze. Thai police seek negligence charges as the country grieves 23 deaths in school bus fire. Rare trial. Singapore ex-minister gets prison in rare corruption case as Singapore opt for good governance. Strong response. Israel attacks central Beirut as Lebanon ground offensive stalls and thousands are desperate to flee the city. And battling big. A gigantic cavern in Tokyo underground is designed to help low-lying Tokyo escape flood damage. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other There No World News Tonight. A very good evening to you and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight where we bring you the latest updates across the globe. I'm Nadi Balasuria. We have many key stories to get you up to date on including the latest developments on the Middle Eastern tensions and we begin in Thailand. Thai police said they were investigating whether the school bus fire that killed 23 students and teachers in Bangkok was caused by negligence after fi filing initial charges against the driver. The fire on the bus carrying six teachers and 39 elementary and junior high school students spread so quickly as many were unable to escape. It was a field trip to a science museum that turned into a parent's worst nightmare. The bodies of the 20 Thai school children and their three teachers were returned to their families after DNA testing was carried out to identify the charred remains. On Tuesday, their bus hit a barrier and burst into flames, trapping many inside. In golden white coffins, the victims were carried away in ambulances as family members wept and passers-by came to pay their final respects. Thai police arrested the bus driver just hours after the accident and charged him with reckless driving, causing death and injury, as well as failure to report the accident and help others. An investigation is underway. It initially found that the driver was not speeding, but police did find more natural gas canisters on the bus than was permitted. This may have caused the blaze to spread so quickly. With a nation in mourning, the accident sheds light on Thailand's road safety. Save the Children said it should be a wake-up call for lawmakers. As the nation has the second worst road safety record in Asia after Nepal, there are some 20,000 road deaths in Thailand every year. A hospital electrical fire in the southernmost county of Pingtung in Taiwan killed six people. The incident occurred on the same day the health ministry was working to evacuate patients to other facilities due to Krathon, which made landfall as a weekend typhoon in southwestern Taiwan. The fire occurred in Pingtung County, which has been hit hard by Typhoon Kraton, which made landfall in the afternoon with torrential rains and heavy winds and has brought parts of the island to a standstill, the Associated Press said. The deaths were attributed to the smoke that arose from a source still under investigation. Dozens of other patients were evacuated and moved to nearby shelters. Reporters indicate that soldiers from a nearby base were mobilized to aid medical workers and firefighters in the evacuation of patients and putting out the flames. As many as 176 patients were rushed to the front entrance and transferred to ambulances or traps used to shield them from the pouring rain. They were moved to shelters nearby. Meanwhile, Kratom made landfall as a much weaker Category 1 typhoon around midday at the major port city of Kaiseong. The government, though, still warned people to stay at home given torrential rain, strong winds and storm surges coinciding with high tide. A Singapore court sentenced a former high-profile minister to 12 months in prison for obstructing justice and receiving more than $300,000 worth of gifts. This comes as the first jailing of an ex-cabinet member in a city-state famous for its clean governance. A Singapore court sentenced a former minister to 12 months in prison in the sort of corruption case the city-state rarely sees. Subramaniam is Warren. A cabinet member for 13 years pleaded guilty to four counts of improperly receiving gifts worth more than $300,000 and one count of obstructing justice. The sentence was harsher than the six to seven months requested by the prosecution. However, the judge deemed the shorter span manifestly inadequate given the seriousness of his offenses and their impact on public trust. The case has shocked Singapore, which prides itself on having an efficient bureaucracy with strong and clean governance. Is Warren faces allegations that he accepted lavish gifts from businessmen while serving as transport minister. 
They include tickets from Singapore's Formula One Grand Prix, English Premier League matches, London musicals, and a private jet ride. He's also accused of taking kickbacks from property tycoon Ong Beng Seng, who holds the rights to the Grand Prix. Ong has not been charged and hasn't commented on the allegations. The Attorney General's chambers said he will decide soon whether to take action against him. Iswaran had served as an advisor to the Grand Prix Steering Committee. He initially claimed innocence but pleaded guilty last week to five charges, two of which were originally corruption-related, but changed to receiving gifts as public servant. The Attorney General's chamber said they made amendments due to the litigation risk of proving the corruption charges beyond a reasonable doubt. The court said he can remain on bail for a few days and will start his jail term on Monday. Singapore was ranked among the world's top five least corrupt countries last year by Transparency International. The last corruption case involving a Singaporean minister was in 1986 when the National Development Minister was investigated for alleged bribery but died before any charges were filed. A regional airport in southwest Japan was closed after a U.S. bombshell likely dropped during World War II to stem kamikaze attacks exploded near its runway. The incident caused nearly 90 flight cancellations. The Land and Transport Ministry confirmed that no aircraft were near explosion at Misayake Airport in southwestern Japan. An investigation by the Self-Defense Forces and Police identified the bomb caused as 500-pound U.S. bomb with no further threats detected. Authorities are still determining what triggered the sudden detonation. Footage from a nearby aviation school captured the blast, showing chunks of asphalt flying into the air like a fountain. Videos aired on Japanese TV revealed a crater on the taxiway approximately 7 meters in diameter and 1 meter deep. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimisa Hayashi announced that more than 80 flights had been cancelled with hopes of resuming airport operations today morning. Miyazaki Airport, originally built in 1943 as an Imperial Japanese Navy flight training site, was used by some pilots for suicide attack missions during the war. Defense Ministry officials noted that several unexploded bombs from the U.S. air raids during the World War II have been discovered in this region. Across Japan, hundreds of tons of unexploded ordnance from the war remain buried and are occasionally uncovered during construction. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, on the campaign trail, Vice President Kamala Harris visited the battleground of Georgia. Harris was in the storm zone visiting the Emergency Operations Center in Augusta, Georgia there with the Red Cross distributing food. Her visit comes after last night's vice presidential debate between Tim Walls and J.D. Vance. In storm-ravaged Georgia tonight, Kamala Harris comforting victims of Hurricane Helene, serving meals and handing out water to community members in need. The coordination that we have um, dedicated ourselves to will be long-lasting to get families, to get residents, to get neighborhoods back up and running. Harris spent the day touring the state, meeting with local officials on the ground and thanking first responders. So I'm here to thank you. I know these are long days for you. With Harris in Georgia, her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, hitting the crucial battleground of Pennsylvania, fresh off of the debate stage. Did anybody watch the debate last night? <laughs> For Walls, it was a sometimes shaky performance, but the campaign seizing on this moment, Walls denouncing Donald Trump's actions on January 6th and calling out his running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, for refusing to admit Trump lost the 2020 election. With fears mounting of an all-out war in the Middle East, Israeli missiles hit the center of Beirut as the nation is looking to retaliate after Iran's attack earlier this week. This is the first Israeli strike close to Beirut's center, just meters away from Lebanon's parliament. There were five other airstrikes overnight against targets in the southern suburb of Dahiye. Fears of a wider all-out war are growing in the Middle East. An Israeli airstrike in central Beirut, Lebanon's capital, in the early hours of Thursday hit a building where the Hezbollah-affiliated Islamic Health Authority were located. The Lebanese health ministry said the airstrike killed at least six people and left at least seven injured. 
The airstrike, which Israeli military called a precise strike, hit a building not far from Lebanon's parliament. Israeli troops are also involved in ground operations in southern Lebanon against Iran-backed Hezbollah fighters. The Israel Defense Forces said eight of its soldiers had been killed in combat in southern Lebanon, its first losses since the start of ground operations earlier this week. According to senior U.S. and Israeli officials, recent Israeli strikes have destroyed about 50 percent of Hezbollah's weapons, including missiles and rockets. And on Thursday, Iran-backed group Yemen's Houthi rebels claimed it attacked a target in an Israeli city using drones overnight. Meanwhile, after Iran launched its largest ever attack on Israel on Tuesday, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations stated that he will not sit idly by. U.S. President Joe Biden condemned Iran's attacks. With fears of a regional war looming in the Middle East, countries with citizens in Lebanon are planning evacuations and urging those remaining to leave. Meanwhile, Israel said it was beefing up its forces on the Lebanon border as Hezbollah said it had pushed back Israeli troops from a border town. Hezbollah said its fighters were engaging Israeli forces inside Lebanon on Wednesday. Such ground clashes would be the first since Israel began pushing into its northern neighbor in a campaign against the Iran-backed group. This video, released by Israel's military, purports to show its troops in southern Lebanon. Reuters was not able to independently verify the location or the date when the video was filmed. The IDF said regular infantry and armored units were joining its ground operations in Lebanon. That's a day after Israel was attacked by Iran, prompting fears of a wider conflict in the Middle East. Iran said the attack, its biggest on Israel, was overbarring further provocation. But Israel and the United States have promised to hit back. The violence, meanwhile, continued on the Israeli-Lebanon border. Displaced people like Ada have been flocking to this shelter in the southern Lebanese city, Sidon. Hezbollah said it was clashing with Israeli troops in the border town of Maroon El Ras. That's after it said pushing back forces near other border towns. Hezbollah also said it had fired rockets at military posts inside Israel. The group's media chief said those battles were only, quote, the first round, and that it had enough fighters, weapons and ammunition to push Israel back. There was no immediate comment from Israel. However, Defence Minister Yoav Gallant visited troops near the border on Wednesday. He said those who harm Israel will, quote, pay the price. The Israeli military has said its incursion is largely aimed at destroying tunnels and other infrastructure on the border. It has also said there were no plans for a wide operation targeting Beirut or other major cities in southern Lebanon. Nearly 1,900 people have been killed and more than 9,000 wounded in Lebanon in almost a year of cross-border fighting, with most of the deaths occurring in the past two weeks, according to Lebanese government statistics. More than a million people have been forced to flee their homes. While Lebanese streets are severely hit by Israeli missiles, Australia is joining forces with Britain and Canada to organize evacuation flights out of water on Lebanon, with thousands of people at risk of being stranded in Beirut. Beirut rubble from a deadly Israeli missile strike. This is what Australian Josiane Vikas is witnessing yeah. daily. She's been in the Lebanese capital six weeks to help out family. Josiane was scheduled to fly out last weekend. Her flight cancelled. The next one too. The earliest she can get out now, a week and a half away. Commercial flights out of Beirut are listed for as much as $25,000 in the days ahead. And boat operators are charging customers up to $2,000 for a trip to Cyprus. And for those lucky enough to secure a plane ticket, citizens in the region needing help to get out can call DFAT or register online. Andrew Proben, Nine News. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned Iran's missile attack on Israel, telling the Security Council that the deadly cycle of tit-for-tat violence must stop. 
Amid growing fears of an all-out war in the Middle East following recent days' escalation and exchange of hostilities, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres today reiterated his appeals for a ceasefire in Gaza, a cessation of hostilities in Lebanon and an end to the violence in the region during another Security Council emergency meeting. The raging fires in the Middle East are fast becoming an inferno, warned the Secretary General, who exactly one week ago briefed the 15-member organ about the alarming situation pointing to the temporary ceasefire proposed by the United States and France to allow for the restart of negotiations. He said Israel refused the proposal and stepped up its strikes, including bombing the Hezbollah headquarters where its leader was killed and conducting a limited incursion into southern Lebanon, while Hezbollah has continued rocket and missile attacks on Israel. The UN Secretary-General reiterated that this deadly cycle of tit-for-tat violence must stop, underscoring that civilians are paying a terrible price, with more than 1,700 killed and over 300,000 displaced in Lebanon since October 2023. He urged the international community to fully fund the UN's humanitarian appeal. Some diplomatic updates now. The leaders of China and Russia exchanged congratulatory messages today on the 75th anniversary of their diplomatic relations, both emphasizing the importance of expanding cooperation. According to Chinese news agency Xinhua, Chinese President Xi Jinping expressed his readiness to expand all-round pragmatic cooperation between the two countries. Russian President Vladimir Putin noted in his message to Xi that their relationship has reached its highest level in history. He also called for further strengthening the bilateral comprehensive strategic partnership to promote security and stability across Eurasia and beyond. British Prime Minister Keir Starmer meets European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in Brussels and holds a new conference as part of Starmer's efforts to improve post-Brexit ties between Britain and the European Union. Starmer, whose Labour Party won an election in July, has said his government will not seek a wholesale negotiation of the Brexit deal that took Britain out of the EU in 2020, but he is looking to tweak the relationship in a range of areas. He said after arriving in Brussels that he firmly believes that British public wants a return to pragmatic, sensible leadership when it comes to dealing with their closest neighbours and that they are determined to put this relationship back on a stable positive footing that he thinks everyone wants to see. Starmer has already visited Berlin, Paris, Rome and Dublin since the election to lay the groundwork for a reset. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And finally tonight, Climate change and unpredictable rain are here to stay, but the Japanese are improvising a huge underground cavern called the Cathedral to save their capital Tokyo from flooding. It looks like a secret underground cavern from the set of a movie, but it's actually a facility designed to keep Tokyo from flooding. It is one part of a growing system to ensure the expected increase in rainfall doesn't overcome the Japanese capital. Helping to oversee the expansion of this underground system is Shuno Tomo. 59 massive pillars that are 59 feet high and weigh 500 tons each make up what is known as the underground chamber here north of Tokyo. It has enough volume to fit almost 100 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water. When nearby rivers flood, the overflow courses through nearly four miles of massive underground tunnels before collecting here in what is officially known as the Metropolitan Outer Area Underground Discharge Channel. The summer of 2024 was the hottest since records began in 1898, Japan's weather agency said in September. In Tokyo, sudden violent storms known as guerrilla downpours have become increasingly common. Tokyo's flood defenses went into action on August 30th as security cameras captured water pouring into the underground cathedral as a typhoon lashed southwest Japan nearly 400 miles away. The system kicked in four times in June, more than all of last year. During Typhoon Chan Chan, it captured enough water to fill the Tokyo Dome baseball stadium almost four times before pumping it safely into the Etagawa River and out to sea. Work is also underway using a colossal tunneling machine to ground a path through the earth below Tokyo. 
The aim is to capture vast quantities of rain that might otherwise flood the streets above. And that brings us to the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as we've got Anuradhi Vikramasinghe joining you next on the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching and have a good night.